the last of the three uh, energy yielding nutrients that we're going to discuss are the proteins and amino acids. Uh, so of all the nutrients that we consume, only carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins have the ability to give us uh, energy or the ability to do work. Um, a little background on, on proteins. Again, they, they are similar to carbohydrates and lipids in that they can provide energy. Uh, they have the same basic elemental makeup. They have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, just as lipids and carbs do. But they, they are unique in one way in that they have the element nitrogen. Uh, some also will have phosphorus and sulfur too, and I'll show you how that can be in a minute. But without a doubt, um, elementally, you can't have protein unless you have nitrogen. And this is why when we look at um, even our crops um, and we see farmers spraying their fields with fertilizer, one of the biggest nutrients that they're adding to the, the ground is nitrogen. They need the nitrogen in their soils so that plants can make their own proteins and amino acids and, and function properly. They can get um, carbon and oxygen from the carbon dioxide uh, that they consume. Uh, they can uh, get hydrogen and oxygen from water. Uh, but they are absolutely going to need nitrogen and of course also some phosphates and sulfur too. So you do see really fertilizer mixes contain quite a bit of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur for this very reason. Uh, there's no way to make a protein unless you have uh, at least nitrogen available. Um, as with the, the carbohydrates, they're polar, they're asymmetrical, and so if they're small enough, they are soluble in water. Uh, if proteins are very, very long and very large, uh, they'll just be too big and too heavy to stay dissolved in water. Uh, but like their, our carbohydrates, or at least our, our simple carbs, like our sugars, uh, small proteins or small amino acids, they can be dissolved in water. The basic unit or the basic building block of all our proteins uh, is the amino acid. Uh, there are 20 different amino acids in our body, and um, oh, I'm drawing a blank right now. I think it's 12 of them are non-essential amino acids, and I think eight are essential. And I don't expect you to have that memorized. I used to have that memorized for biochemistry, but at, at this level, it's, again, I just want you to recognize essential means that our body doesn't have the ability to make them or make them in high enough quantities, so we have to consume them. The non-essential ones, we, can, uh, we have the metabolic processes to take other amino acids and convert into those amino acids. Uh, so th those 20 different amino acids, some essential, some non-essential, um, they all have the same basic structure. They all have what's called an amino group, which is a, a, a nitrogen with two hydrogens, uh, and a carboxyl group, or sometimes it's called a carboxylic acid group, and it's a, a carbon double bonded to an oxygen and then also bonded to uh, an oxygen-hydrogen group. Uh, all uh, those, the, the amino group and the, the carboxylic acid group are both attached to a central carbon, uh, and then there's a hydrogen off to the side, as well as what we call the R group or the side chain. And I have a picture of that here, and there's some pictures in your text. Um, that side chain, sometimes it's just called the side chain, or sometimes called the R group. And that, that, that R group is what gives the amino acid its unique characteristics. So all 20 amino acids have the amine group or the amino group. They all have the carboxylic acid group and they attach those together. One amino acid to another will attach its carboxylic acid end to the amino end of another one, um, and that creates the backbone uh, chain of the protein. Uh, and then those side chains there, um, you can see here there's some different side chains, valine, leucine, tyrosine. That is what makes the, the amino acid unique from other amino acids. So that is how they will differ is in their R groups. And, um, different R groups, again, will have different characteristics. This is where you sometimes, some of them will have rings, some of them will have a char charge, some of them will have phosphorus, some of them will have sulfur. And depending on the type of protein that you're making, that is going to dictate what types of amino acids go in that protein and in what order they go in. Uh, for example, um, think of skin and hair um, and, your, uh, and your fingernails. They, they're all made up of proteins, basically, but they all have very different textures. Uh, skin and, and is much more elastic, whereas hair is, hair is much more rigid. And even if you think of your fingernails, uh, fingernails have a lot of sulfur in them. The, the, the proteins have a lot of disulfide um, interconnecting bonds throughout the protein structure. And that's due to a lot of sulfur in these side chains. And that gives your, oops, that gives, uh, your fingernails the rigidity that you see. So skin, hair, and nails are all protein, but because of those different combinations of amino acids, the protein structure looks and functions very differently. 
how do we make a protein? And, and really, these types of reactions you see uh, not just with protein synthesis and breakdown, but also in carbohydrate and lipid synthesis and breakdown. Uh, two major reactions. One's called a dehydration synthesis reaction. Whenever you join um, two separate amino acids together by con connecting the amino group and the carboxylic acid group, you remove a water molecule. So you're going to remove two hydrogens and an oxygen when you do that. And we call that a dehydration synthesis reaction. Dehydration because we're removing water. When you're dehydrated, water's been removed. So dehydration synthesis means water's been removed, and synthesis means we've made something. So we've gone from two amino acids and joined them together to make um, a, a, what we call a dipeptide. Hydrolysis reaction, the name, again, the name tells you what it means. Hydro refers to water, and lysis means to break up or to pop or, or to lyse in some way. Hydrolysis reactions are used by splitting apart two amino acids into separate amino acids by adding water. So it's just the opposite reaction. We add water to split apart two molecules, and in this case, when we're talking about proteins, we're splitting apart two amino acids. So this here, hydrolysis and dehydration reactions, but especially just referring to hydrolysis for the moment, um, this is another reason why at the very basic biochemical level, water is so important in your metabolism. Think about this. If you eat a cheeseburger and fries and a milkshake or any sort of um, you know, large molecules, large protein molecules, fat, large carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates, how do you break those down? How does your digestive system break those down? Well, we talked about that a little bit, how the pancreas will dump lots of digestive enzymes uh, to break down our carbs and our fats and the like. But the enzymes aren't enough. You, you can't just break down molecules using enzymes. When you um, need to split these apart, you also need to add a water molecule. So water is extremely important for your diet. Uh, water helps increase your metabolism. And this is one of the reasons why water will keep your metabolism up there. If you, if you want to process your food effectively and quickly, you need water molecules around to do it. So to break down those molecules that you consume when you digest food, if you're going to do it efficiently, you need to make sure you're not dehydrated. So again, both of these reactions are seen in the building up and breaking down of carbohydrates and lipids too. Same type of process. When we um, join two amino acids together, the bond that we form between those two amino acids is called a peptide bond. Uh, and again, the two amino acids joined together is known as a dipeptide. Three amino acids, a tripeptide. Many, many, another name for many is poly, like polygamy means many wives. Many amino acids refers to a polypeptide. And really, the, the name that we use for a polypeptide is the protein. So a protein is essentially another name for a polypeptide. Kind of like a carbohydrate is the, the name we use when we talk about a polysaccharide. Uh, remember the monosaccharides, the disaccharides, when we're talking about the carbohydrate group. Same type of naming scheme that you see here with proteins. They're similar anyway. So um, how do we make our proteins? How does our body decide how to make proteins? Well, refer back again to your cells. All of your cells contain inside the nucleus, they contain uh, DNA, which is the genetic blueprint for your body and, and all the codes you need to uh, make the building of who you are. Uh, within your DNA, there's small segments of DNA that are copied into what's called messenger RNA, and those leave the nucleus and get translated into protein. Those small segments of DNA are known as our genes. So when you have a gene that's been turned on, whether it's skin color or eye color or a liver enzyme or uh, pancreatic insulin, whatever the, the, the gene is, when that gene gets turned on, that small segment of the DNA, that gene, will get copied into what's called messenger RNA. That messenger RNA leaves the nucleus and goes into the cytoplasm of the cell where it goes to another organelle and gets translated into a protein. So the code within your DNA that gets tran transcribed into mRNA then gets read into a code for the protein. And the order of the code of that mRNA literally codes directly for the amino acids in the protein. So thus, in order to actually get your amino acids in the right order, you, you have those uh, amino acid sequences dictated by your genes. So when someone says they have a genetic mutation, we usually see that manifest itself in a protein that doesn't get made right or doesn't get made at all. 
Um, that's what we see in the case of type 1 diabetes. Uh, insulin is a hormone, but it's a, actually a hormone that is a protein-based hormone, and it's coded for by our genes. Uh, if you have a mutation in the gene that codes for insulin, and the amino acids don't get laid down in the right order, um, that protein will not function properly. So that's where the code for our proteins come from, and that's how we know what types of proteins to make. Um, the roles of proteins, man, proteins have so many functions in our body. Um, you know, really, I, I mentioned already that they are an energy yielding molecule, but really that's, that's really their, probably their least important role. Um, when you look at all, almost all of our body structures, you see proteins involved. Uh, they are structural components. They help with movement. They help with protection. Uh, you see them in our muscle fibers. Our actin, myosin filaments are what uh, help make our muscles move. Connective tissues, ligaments, tendons, even part of our bone. Collagen, elastin, the, the proteins in our skin that give it a, a elasticity to it. Um, skin, hair, nails, skin color. Uh, melanin is a, a pigment uh, with a protein base to it that gives us our skin color. Fibrinogen, keratin, uh, those things all give um, texture to our, our, our hair and our nails. Uh, so lots and lots of different functions. Um, homeostasis, again, homeostasis refers to maintaining an internal balance no matter what's happening outside of us. If the temperature is 100 degrees, we do things with our body to maintain a certain temperature. If it's 50 below zero outside, again, the same thing. Our body will do different things to try and maintain that 98.6 Fahrenheit temperature. And proteins help us do this. And again, um, proteins um, can be hormones like insulin that help regulate our blood sugar. Uh, proteins can also be um, blood proteins that help create buffer systems within our blood and help regulate the pH. We also have proteins in our blood that help with clotting. So if we have damage to tissue or a cut in our tissue, uh, those proteins will clot so that our blood will um, coagulate and, and, and we will quit bleeding so we don't bleed out. Uh, so lots of functions of um, proteins within our body. Uh, hormones, uh, just to note, hormones can, can either be lipid-based or those sterile compounds I mentioned in another unit, uh, like testosterone and estrogen, or they can be protein-based, like insulin. Uh, carbohydrates don't make up any of our hormones. Just the protein and the, the lipid-based co uh, compounds make up um, our uh, different hormones. Also, major role in metabolism. Just about every enzyme we have in our body is a protein. Uh, enzymes are catalysts that speed up the rate of chemical reactions without themselves being altered in the process, and thus they're the, the ultimate recycler. They just keep getting reused and reused and reused, and they help to um, break down the food that we eat. They help to uh, speed up different metabolic pathways. Uh, there's just so many different um, processes that we rely on enzymes to do. Um, and uh, just our metabolism is just one of the many roles that enzymes play a huge role in. So uh, proteins make up the, the bulk of our enzymes and, and play those roles. Um, respiration. Um, hemoglobin is a protein that's found inside our red blood cells. Hemoglobin has uh, four iron centers inside of it, um, and that, um, th that iron uh, binds readily to oxygen. And so it can carry oxygen from our lung tissue uh, within the blood and uh, to our um, tissues of the body and then release that oxygen and then pick up carbon dioxide and take it back to the lungs. So we do rely on uh, proteins to help make up the hemoglobin in our red blood cells. Uh, fighting infections. Not only do we have proteins that uh, can clot and coagulate our blood if we have a cut, but they also um, make up our antibodies. We have... Um, immune system cells called B lymphocytes or B cells and those B cells produce antibodies. They're little Y-shaped proteins and their job is to bind and immobilize bacteria. So without, um, without proteins we wouldn't have that component of our immune system. And then again there's, there's so many roles to mention but just some other ones to touch on. All of those um, channel proteins, glycoproteins, receptor proteins, um, tight junctions, interconnecting proteins, a cytoskeletal network uh, inside our cells. All these different things help with cellular structure, transporting, signaling, cell recognition, cell communication. Uh, proteins play major, major roles in all of that. Um, 
again, uh, so you, you see all these major roles, but then also just think of when you, your body functions, you have to repair damaged tissue. When your body grows, you're going to need to lay down more um, bone and muscle tissue. So you see not only do they have um, major functions within the body, but their con proteins are constantly needed just for growth and repair. So uh, anytime you have embryonic or fetal development, you need more protein. Anytime you're very physically active or very physically fit, your muscles and joints are always being worked and they need to be repaired. Uh, and um, certain tissues might need to be replaced or built if you're working them really hard. You'll lay down new muscle mass. Uh, growing children absolutely need more protein. Uh, your blood supply, your blood supply is recycled. Uh, red blood cells, once they mature and circulate in, in your arteries and veins, uh, they don't divide anymore. They have met the end of their lifespan and they will just carry oxygen until they, until they die out. And um, so your, your bone marrow has to constantly be cranking out new red blood cells. So you gotta replace those uh, hemoglobin uh, molecules inside those red blood cells. Um, as much of a pain as it sounds like it is, we're very thankful that we constantly can replenish our blood supply because this allows us to donate blood. Uh, if you were not able to replenish your blood supply, if you only had a finite amount of blood, we wouldn't have the ability to donate blood. Um, repairing damaged tissues, uh, scar tissue has lots of extra um, uh, connective tissue laid down, collagen and elastin tissue. That's why it usually has a lighter color, a lighter texture, and it's much more rubbery. So repairing damaged tissue, every time your hair grows, every time your nails grow, you are laying down new proteins. So lots and lots of functions. You can see uh, very quickly that there are lots of functions to proteins. Um, so have a general sense of some of these major functions of proteins. Again, you can see there's lots of structural components, a lot of enzymatic components, metabolic components. Uh, and proteins are very, very important into our body, in, in how our body functions, and also in how our, bo our body structures are laid down. So without proteins, we wouldn't exist. Um, but uh, just to touch on, I, I don't want to leave this part out, um, it is an energy molecule like carbohydrates and lipids. It does provide us with an energy source, but it really is the body's last choice of the three energy yielding molecules. Uh, and again, you can kind of see why. Um, it has so many other roles that it can fulfill uh, that to be metabolizing protein for energy doesn't you know, seem like a major, um, major role of proteins, and it's not. You, you see the carbohydrates are really what uh, are our first energy source. It's our, our circulating uh, energy source is glucose, which is a carbohydrate. Our, um, our molecule that sustains us between meals is glycogen, which is a carbohydrate. Uh, and our long-term energy storage is, is the, the lipid group um, because it's so efficient at storing high levels of energy in um, uh, the same amount of um, volume as a, um, a, a carb or a, a protein. Uh, so you just, you, you can get energy from proteins, but you can see that it's not uh, a leading role for proteins. Uh, that being said though, um, we do metabolize some of our proteins for energy. Um, but to do this, not only are proteins uh, serving us in many, many other ways, if we, if we do want to use protein for energy, or we do use some of our protein for energy, uh, you can see also why it's not the first choice. Um, when you look at the protein structure, again, remember that the protein has that amino group, which contains the nitrogen. And the first thing that has to happen for us to utilize energy out of the amino acid um, is to strip off that amino group uh, and then basically what you have once you strip off that amino group is you have a skeleton of, of a carbohydrate. You have a skeleton of, of what will be a, a, a glucose molecule. You're left with the carbon, the oxygen, and the hydrogen. And then it goes down into a different metabolic pathway where it will be metabolized and, and we'll get energy from it. But uh, the first thing that happens is that amino group gets stripped away and that amino group is very toxic. It can very easily form ammonia, which um, a lot of your household cleaners have ammonia. Uh, you, you smell your you know, pine salts and things like that. You're rubbing, not you're rubbing alcohol, but some of those ammonium cleaners, um, you take a whiff of those and you know what I'm talking about. I mean, we use ammonia to clean stuff, so you know it's toxic to bacteria. If you're using it to, to clean surfaces, you're using it as a disinfectant. You're, you're trying to destroy life forms. So 
you know um, the amino group can be toxic because it can quickly form ammonia. Uh, and what we'll do with that um, amino group to try and make it less toxic is we'll combine it with carbon dioxide and water to form urea, which is our principal liquid waste product. So ammonia is highly toxic. There is a little bit of it in our body, uh, but not much. Um, ammonia is how fish get rid of their waste, but again, they, they swim in water, so they have lots of um, fluid to flush their system out, so they don't have to worry about building up toxic waste. Um, but we will convert it into urea, and that urea gets circulated um, through the blood system and eventually will run through the kidneys where it gets excreted into collecting ducts and makes up our urine. So when you, uh, when you look at your urine, of course the, the major component of urine is going to be water, the fluid that makes up the urine. But the, when you look at the smell of your urine or your, you, you smell your urine and um, look at the color and all that, what you're really seeing is water, urea, and some basically some salts, um, some sodium, maybe some potassium, calcium. We secrete a few um, different ions, but really that's that's the bulk of what your urine is, is, is just water and urea. Um, and the more highly concentrated the urea, the stronger the smell of your urine will be. Um, but again, what's left once you break down that amino acid, um, you, you have that carbon, hydrogen, oxygen base, and that gets metabolized much like carbohydrates and lipids. It's, it's a slightly different metabolic pathway, which I don't expect you to know at this level, but um, you're essentially left with that skeleton of, of a carbohydrate. And, you take that and then metabolize it for energy. So again, why is the last choice for energy? Well, you've got to take all these extra steps to what we call deaminate. If, if you have a deamination reaction or you deaminate a molecule, that means you remove the amino group. Deaminate means rem to remove the amino group. Uh, so that's an extra step that you don't have to do with carbs and lipids. Uh, and then also you create all this excess urea waste on top of what you're already producing from protein use. We naturally produce uh, urea just from protein metabolism in other parts of the body. But if you're constantly using protein as an energy choice, that's going to make excess urea waste that your body might be used to processing. And that, um, that can be hard on the kidneys over time. So um, if there's not, um, and also too, if there's not enough energy molecules available, we don't store protein in our bodies as an energy source. We store fats you know, in our adipose tissue and we store glycogen in our muscle and liver, um, but we don't really have like a, you know, it's not like we put a bunch of protein in our butt and say, okay, that's where I'm storing all my energy or I've got a big old spare tire on my gut and that's all protein and that's gonna be my storage of energy. No, if we're carrying around excess weight, that excess weight is in the form of, of lipids and fats. Um, so when you actually, if, if you aren't eating properly and you're left with the protein in your body is the only energy source, you literally will atrophy your muscles. You'll waste away lean muscles as an energy source. And so you don't want to be taking structural components of your body. You don't want to be taking lean muscle mass and connective tissues and breaking them down for energy. That's not a good sign. That's a sign that you've got some serious nutrition issues. So again, it does provide us with energy, does provide us with four kilocalories per gram, and we do use a little bit of it for energy, but the bulk of protein function in the body is for things like uh, enzyme function, structural components, support structures, growth, reproduction. We don't typically use proteins as an energy source. And um, if we're using protein as a major energy source, our, our diet is definitely out of whack. So how do we process our proteins? In our mouth, uh, there is no digestion, no chemical digestion of proteins at this point. The only uh, thing that occurs in our mouth is mechanical digestion or, or what we call physical digestion where we actually phys physically mash the food. We chew it up, we moisten it, we cut into that steak. Nothing really happens uh, to the protein until it gets to the stomach acid. Uh, so once we swallow it and it gets to the stomach, uh, this is really where that hydrochloric acid of the stomach really comes into play. Uh, we need that hydrochloric acid so that enzymes can properly function, but uh, one of the ma other major roles of that stomach acid is to do what's called denature or denaturing of our proteins. Um, 
acids are great at helping uncoil and unravel those long protein, uh, those long amino acid strands that make up the protein. Uh, I think of it like a hairball that's all tangled together and you need to comb through it and unwind them. Enzymes can't get in there to break apart those amino acid strings if, if they're all tangled up. So uh, that acid environment of the stomach helps us to denature, unwind uh, that protein. Uh, there's other things that denature protein as well. Um, heat denatures protein. We see this when we cook an egg on the stove. Everyone has cooked a raw egg and seen its clear liquidy edges and uh, yellowish orange center. You see how it changes once it's exposed to heat. Well, whether you eat the egg raw or you eat it cooked, you're still consuming the same protein content, but you have physically changed the structure of those proteins by adding heat. And it's never going to go back to a little chicken ever again. You, um, you've used heat to, to um, shift those strands of protein around. Um, you see this when you dry your clothes, uh, especially things like wool and cotton, which are protein. Uh, those, are, those are plant fibers that are protein fibers. If you dry those on high heat in your dryer, you see very quickly how a wool sweater can look like it goes on your kid's Barbie doll. Um, anyone who is um, not well versed in the right temperature settings for clothing recognizes very quickly that heat can denature or change uh, our proteins, especially those cotton fibers and those wool fibers. So again, um, the light of the stomach is protected by that stomach uh, from that acid. Um, and the, um, there's uh, enzymes, um, enzymes by a mucus coating secreted by the stomach uh, cells as well. The stomach cells will secrete um, enzymes and, and also this mucus coating will protect the, the stomach cells. So by the time the, the um, protein gets to the small intestine, you have um, all these small, partially chopped up, denatured pieces of protein from the stomach. Um, some of them are already to a few single um, amino acids, but most are still in polypeptide form. Most are um, chopped up into smaller pieces, but they're still multiple amino acids long. Uh, they've just been um, digested partially. Now the small intestine will uh, receive uh, bicarbonate from the pancreas, which will neutralize that stomach acid uh, delivered, um, uh, that acid delivered by the stomach. And that increases the pH back to about seven, which is neutral. So now, again, we're outside of the stomach, so we need to neutralize that acid. Um, now more protein digesting enzymes will come in from the pancreas and, and the small intestine and continue to break down all those protein uh, molecules until they're really just single amino acids and some dipeptides and tripeptides. Now, these guys are, are small enough that they can be uh, shuttled across uh, the small intestine and carried to the tissues. So um, you see lots of enzymes like pepsin and trypsin. Uh, these are all enzymes that are released by your pancreas that uh, help to digest the protein. And then um, again, a lot of digestion and absorption occurs in the small intestine. So this is where you see really the bulk of that final breakdown occurring of the protein and then also all the absorption of those um, amino acids uh, through the blood to the tissues. Again, as I, I mentioned, de the denaturing of proteins, uh, you, you can't put that uh, fried egg back in the shell and get a chicken out of it. Once you've denatured that protein, uh, it's not going back to the way it was. And there's lots of different ways to do that. You can use heat, uh, acids and bases, alcohols. Um, sometimes you can use uh, heavy metal salts. Um, that's really the first step in destruction of a protein. So when you eat, again, you are what you eat when you eat a hamburger or a glass of milk or a piece of cheese. But what you do is you first denature and, and break apart that protein, and then you use that, the building blocks of that protein, those amino acids, to make your own protein. So again, we, denaturing damages those body proteins, but it's important in the digestion of uh, food proteins. So you don't want to denature your own body proteins, but uh, you want to denature the proteins that you're digesting. So uh, very, very important in the process of uh, breaking those peptide bonds, cleaving them up, and getting those building blocks so you can make your own proteins. So good protein sources. Um, as mentioned with uh, carbohydrates, um, you know, a lot of the, the grains, nuts, uh, rice, um, oh, excuse me, the, the rice, the grains, the fruits are all good sources of um, carbohydrates. It's kind of the opposite here. The, the ones that weren't as good as sources of carbohydrates tend to be the better sources for protein, again, in general. 
um, but you know, meat, eggs, fish, poultry, um, dairy products, they tend to be great protein sources. Not so good for carbohydrate sources. Um, dairy can be good, again, for some simple carbs, some, some milk sugars, but really where you see the great sources of protein are going to be from these different uh, meat products um, and uh, animal products. Beans are a great source of protein, tofu, hummus, those are all bean products. Those are good sources of protein. Peanut butter, nuts, seeds, all of those things. Any sort of seed product or nut product is going to have a lot of protein. And again, essential amino acids have to be consumed. Non-essential amino acids can be made by the body from other amino acids. Uh, a little bit on supplements. Uh, next time, again, you go to the store, um, uh, go take a walk down the pharmacy aisles and uh, look at the, the different supplements, a lot of the different, um, oh, what's a big brand name, like the Nature Made supplements. Um, they'll sell, they'll call it L-lysine, L-leucine. They'll have an L, usually an L or a D in front of it. Uh, that just refers to um, uh, the spin of the molecule, essentially. Um, uh, there's the L form and the D form. Um, but anyway, um, it's neither here nor there. You'll, you'll see these names, alanine, glycine, leucine, serine, theranine, alanine, phenylalanine. Those are all names of amino acids. And you can buy all of them individually. You can go to the store and buy supplements that have all the 20 amino acids that you would need to make all of your proteins. Uh, and some people do do this. And there's there's some... Uh, some evidence, there's some studies out there that certain enzymes, uh, or excuse me, certain amino acids uh, will help with uh, immune system function or help uh, stave off cold sore outbreaks, different things like that. Um, but for the most part, um, you don't really need these. Um, again, think of how the body processes food. The body is designed not based on our, our evolution of our, you know, medicines and drugs, it's based on the evolution of how our body um, uh, hunts and gathers food. And we, our digestion is designed to consume whole proteins. Um, and so that allows for a slower rate of assimilation. It takes time to process those foods. It takes time to break them down. And we have um, certain shuttle uh, carriers that help um, amino acids get absorbed into the bloodstream and carried to tissues. So when you have all these excess amino acids, it just pro it ties up these protein carriers which are designed to, to be like a shuttling mechanism within our blood. Whereas if you have just a slower assimilation, that, that uh, doesn't uh, tie up all those protein carriers at once. So really, truly you waste a lot of these individual amino acids because again, they're all readily available to you as soon as you consume them. They don't have to be digested in any way. And so it creates kind of this backlog. So there's, if, as long as you're eating a wide variety of protein sources, there's really no benefit to amino acid supplements. And again, I, um, you know, some students will say, well, I have this health condition or I, you know, I, I have a really strict vegan diet and I tend to be short on this amino acid. Or if you have a specific health condition or there's something you worked out with your doctor, absolutely. I mean, don't... Um, I'm not trying to diagnose any conditions. Some of you might know of specific conditions where you do need a supplement. It's not to say that, that there are people out there that might have trouble with absorption of certain amino acids and they might need a supplement. But on the whole, when you look at a healthy person who has a, a normal, healthy diet that has a wide variety of protein sources, you should be hitting all your amino acids and that process of slowly digesting them and assimilating them into your body really works best and again saves you a ton of money uh, you're not buying amino acid supplements so how much protein do I need well if you remember back to looking at food labels um, there's no actual daily value percentage for proteins as there is for um, the carbs and the lipids and the reason for this is because how much protein we need is based less on um, uh, uh, less on, on your size or your age and more on your stage of life and your activity level than what your calorie needs are. Again, we don't typically use a lot of our proteins to meet our caloric needs. So it's not really based on the 2,000 calorie diet. It's really based more on things like uh, you know, how much you work out, how much you go to the gym, are you male or female, are you 18 or are you 58? All these things are going to affect how much protein you need. And so how do you just kind of get a rough idea of how much protein you need in a day? 
And again, this is a rough estimate, and everybody's a little different, but just to kind of give you a sense, a, a, a typical rule of thumb is that if you want to know how much protein you need in a day, take a third of your weight, and that's the approximate number of grams of protein you need in a day. So, for example, I have here a 150-pound man should consume about 50 grams of protein per day. And again, that's an approximation. If it's a man, maybe a little bit more than this. If it's a woman, maybe a little bit less. Men tend to have more lean muscle mass. Um, they tend to do more physical activity or do heavier. When they do physical activity, they tend to do more heavy physical activity compared to a woman. They tend to just be physically stronger. Um, not trying to stereotype. Not everyone falls in that category. Uh, but, you know, same thing with, you know, younger adults and, and, and ch children. They tend to be more physically active than people in their 80s and 90s. That's not always the case, but uh, usually the case. So if you're younger, if you're male, and if you're very active, you should get more protein. Uh, if you're not as physically active, um, you're probably not going to need as much. Uh, again, women don't typically need as much. Um, I, but again, there's always, um, there's always exceptions to this. If you're a pregnant woman or you're a lactating woman, you're going to need more. Um, children who are growing, they're going to need more. Um, but typically when you look at your average um, calories per day, um, really the upper limit for how many ca total calories you should get from your protein shouldn't be greater than 35%. So in any given day, you're, you're looking at what? About a third of your daily calories, no more than that, should be coming from protein. And again, uh, the reason why is because we don't want to have excess protein that we're not using for body functions that we have to get rid of in the form of urea. So um, important one thing to look at, uh, protein does affect our nitrogen balance. And so absolutely those stages of our life and how active we are are going to affect our nitrogen balance. And so when we look at nitrogen balance, what we're really looking at is how much protein, or excuse me, how much nitrogen are we consuming compared to the amount of nitrogen that we're excreting in a given time and period. And um, there are uh, studies of the nitrogen balance that underlie uh, DRI committee recommendations. So they'll use this information on our nitrogen balance to help us um, figure out how much protein we should be taking in. Because again, um, our major source of nitrogen in our diets is going to be those proteins that we consume. So in normal c circumstances, under normal conditions, if you're just a typical healthy adult, um, you should be in what we call nitrogen equilibrium, which is a zero balance. That essentially translates into, it's not that you don't have nitrogen coming in and nitrogen going out, but whatever you're consuming for nitrogen is about what you're releasing. So uh, a typical healthy adult, a relatively you know, healthy activity level, um, the amount of uh, nitrogen you consume should equal the amount of nitrogen that you excrete in your waste products. A positive nitrogen balance means you're taking in more nitrogen than you're excreting. And we see this in people that are growing, and again, that makes sense. If you're consuming a lot of nitrogen and not excreting it, it's going somewhere else. And it's usually found in the protein of uh, a growing child, um, in a, a fetus, um, in a baby, um, in a pregnant woman, a uh, lactating woman, um, or somebody who is putting on muscle mass through uh, weightlifting or some sort of athlete. So, those are the types of people you would see with a positive nitrogen balance. A negative nitrogen balance, this is where you're consuming less nitrogen uh, in reference to what you're losing. So you're actually losing more than you're, than you're taking in. Uh, so this is a sign of, um, this can be a sign of health issues. This can be a sign of certain diseases. Uh, very common, we see this in people that are the elderly, people that are bedridden, um, surgical patients. Uh, typically not a good sign. This is a sign that, uh, you're, you're wasting away somehow, you're, you're losing muscle mass, you're losing bone mass. Um, we see this in astronauts, people that spend time in outer space tend to lose a lot of bone density and lose a lot of muscle density. These are people that are at negative nitrogen balance, so uh, recommendations will vary based on these different uh, conditions of your life. So what happens when we consume too little protein? We'll talk a little bit about consuming too much and too little, excuse me, First, we'll talk about what happens when you consume too little protein. There's two major disease categories we see when we see people consume too little protein. And usually these diseases are um, uh, coinciding with other sorts of nutrient deficiencies. People who are struggling with these two issues also have other major, major nutrient deficiencies. 
but uh, these are the two types of deficiencies we see in people with uh, some protein deficiency issues. Uh, Marasmus and Kwashiorkor's disease. Uh, Marasmus is uh, really where you see chronic inadequate food intake. People who have Marasmus are not only uh, deprived of protein, um, but they're deprived of many uh, vitamin and minerals, uh, energy levels are very low. The people who have marasmus tend to have almost like a bag of bones appearance. They have like a very shriveled look all over and very bony appearance. Uh, you can see their ribs, um, the knobby ends of their ribs. Um, uh, very, very lean, thin look to them. Uh, Kwashiorkor's disease is also a protein deficiency disease, but it presents very differently. Kwashiorkor uh, shows a, uh, usually, again, both of these are usually in children where you see them the worst, but the kids will have a very swollen belly. They'll almost look like they're full, um, and they'll often have a skin rash as well, too, but it's, it's a, a form of acute malnutrition. Um, there's just not enough protein to support body functions, and I have pictures of these here. This uh, little guy here on the left, he has marasmus. You can see his skin is... Uh, literally shriveling off his bones. Um, he's uh, way, way underweight for his age. I wish I had the weights, uh, the ages on these guys, but typically children will appear to be three to four years old, but they're really eight to nine years old. Uh, you see very stunted growth. Um, sometimes you can reverse that a little bit if you get them good nutrition, but usually the circumstances are so dire that they've had severe malnourishment for such a long period of time that uh, there's no way to go back. You're not going to get this, this child to full height and uh, proper weight, even if you start with good nourishment now. Uh, but this is Marasmus, and over here, this is Kwashiorkor's disease. And you see that, that characteristic swollen belly. Uh, the reason you see this swollen belly is um, not because they've been eating anything. This is a sign of severe liver inflammation. Uh, children that have Kwashiorkor's disease will have such terrible liver dysfunction that the liver will become chronically inflamed. And it, again, the liver is the, next to the skin, the liver is the largest organ in your body. It's just, um, skin's the largest, and then the liver is the second largest. And so it, the, it really takes up a, a huge section of your torso here. And if it gets swollen, it's gonna cr cause great distension in that abdomen. And so these little kids, they, they look like they're full, but they're actually really starving. Um, the, the name Kwashiorkor is actually, um, it's, um, oh, I'm going to forget, it's, it's a, it translates, it's in, uh, from an African country, and I can't remember off the top of my head what it's called, um, I think it's Liberia, uh, uh, the Kwashiorkors means um, the devil that infects, or the devil that infiltrates the first child when the second child is born. Uh, often what happens with these kids is they won't have protein deficiency until their mother bears another child because they're still breastfeeding. So they will get a protein source from their mother's milk. But once their mother has another child, uh, they get weaned and they no longer have that milk as a protein source. And so that's, that's where the name Kwashiorkor's, come from, Kwashiorkor's disease comes from. It, it literally translates as the devil that inflicts the first child when the second child uh, comes along or is born. So um, kind of an interesting uh, uh, history and translation behind it. I think it's Liberia. It's, it's, an, it's an African country language where it's been translated from. Um, so that's what we can see with severe protein uh, malnourishment. And again, these are very, very severe cases. We don't tend to see this a lot in the United States. Um, but in uh, milder circumstances, if, if somebody has even just moderate protein deficiency over time, you will see things like stunted growth. I mean, um, as, a, as a species in, in the United States, just as a human species here, you can look decade over decade at height data, and you know, 100, 150 years ago in the United States, uh, people were shorter. So over time, people have gotten taller, and a lot of that has to do with good nutrition and, and protein as part of that. So. Uh, you can see somewhat um, stunted growth, uh, even in the United States, even if you don't see these extreme conditions, you will see people that can potentially be a little bit shorter if they have uh, struggled with good protein nourishment as a child. Too much protein. Is it possible to consume too much protein? Um, Overconsumption of protein, there are no health benefits to it. The body is going to use what it needs and get rid of what it doesn't. And really, it can pose some some health risks for several organs, mainly the kidneys. 
The kidneys are the art organ that is really responsible for removing all that excess nitrogen waste as urea. And so if you're consuming more protein than you need, that can be very, very hard in your kidneys. And in full disclosure, uh, to be fair, I'm probably a little biased this way because I personally have kidney issues. I have something called hemonuria or hematinuria, which uh, means blood in the urine. It's, um, there's a certain percentage of the population that just naturally has it. I seem to be one of them. Um, I know I, I don't have it because of any sort of cancer or polyps or anything like that. That's all been screened out. But um, it is an indication of potential kidney disease or kidney dysfunction. And so I'm very sensitive to people who say, well, I'm just going to go on the Atkins diet because it's so good for you and we don't store protein for energy, so I'll just get rid of it as nitrogenous waste. And, and there are a lot of good aspects to the, the Atkins diet, don't get me wrong, but I know those high-protein diet, low-carb, low-fat diets, um, they're not generally well-balanced. And you've got to remember that um, anytime you, you're cutting down on your carbs and your lipids, there are important elements of carbohydrate and lipid nutrition that your body needs. Uh, and so just to cut those out of your diet is going to have some consequences that, are, that can be dire. And then trying to get all of your um, energy sources from proteins is not the way to go either. Again, your, your brain's first choice of fuel is glucose. Uh, if it doesn't have glucose, it will convert to burning fats, but it doesn't like to use protein as an energy source. Uh, so people who... Um, you tend to be on these high protein, low fat, low carb diets, um, it's, it's not really sustainable for the entire term of your life. Um, I really tell students all the time, when they're looking at a diet plan, if you can do it for 50 years, then I recommend it. But most people, it, it's just not realistic to be on a fully protein diet. Um, again, Atkins has, uh, the Atkins diet has plenty of benefits. Um, they do do a good job of emphasizing uh, vegetables in your diet and, and uh, fruits that aren't uh, super sugary fruits. Uh, but as a general rule, I, I kind of frown upon these diets that are used as a, as a weight loss measurement. They're not sustainable in the long run, and having too much protein can be hard on your kidneys. And um, of course, I'm a little bit more versed on this because I've read so much on it for personal reasons, but even people that... Um, just mildly will reduce their protein uh, intake, they can really see effective results on increasing kidney function. Uh, so we do know that high protein diets will actually worsen kidney existing, uh, existing kidney problems and may accelerate their decline. And also just um, people who have just mild kidney disorder can see their symptoms completely go away if they just limit excess protein in their diet. Again, the kidneys are the ones that bear the brunt of all that extra urea waste that has to be processed. So, um, there's no, again, since there's no benefit to eating more protein than you need, um, just, just eat what you need. Don't overconsume on protein. Uh, and try and, and eat those lean meats, the, the poultry, the, the nuts, the beans. Uh, try to keep the low-fat um, protein sources uh, in the front of your diet. Um, Omnivore diets versus vegetarian diets. Omnivore diets, again, remember omnivores. Humans are omnivores. They can eat either animal or plant products uh, and also animal flesh. But we do know that um, in affluent countries, those who eat well-planned vegetarian diets do tend to see a decrease in obesity, heart rate disease, um, high blood pressure rates go down, cancer rates go down. Veget a well-planned vegetarian diet can really be a healthy diet. Uh, but it, it takes a lot of planning in a in a society where there's a lot of meat products. Um, vegetarian diets do often contain not only more uh, foods uh, that contain phytochemicals and vitamins and minerals, but also uh, a lot of fiber and other things that are associated with, the, with reduced disease risk. So uh, a, a vegetarian diet can be, ex ooh, excuse me, can be extremely healthy, but again, it has to be well planned. One of the staples of a healthy diet is, is variety. And when you have a vegetarian diet, or especially a vegan diet, where you don't eat any animal products, even including eggs and dairy, uh, you, you limit the variety right off the bat. And so it can be hard to plan those diets. Again, I, I think if, if you're up for a vegetarian diet, I have more power to you. It just, uh, practically it can be very hard to do, but it, it can absolutely be extremely healthy. 
Uh, and with a few exceptions, people who are that in tune to what they're consuming, they also tend to be paying attention to things like alcohol and tobacco use. They tend to be more physically active and tend to live a longer and higher quality of life. So if you make the effort uh, to be a vegetarian or a vegan, you also tend to make the effort to not consume other products that would be typically harmful to your health in the long run. And again, just a few of the challenges of being a vegetarian. Um, it, you have to really watch the iron um, a lot because you're not getting those protein, you don't have as many protein sources. Iron is often found in a lot of those protein sources, especially those meats, those red meats. Uh, and that can leave you with iron deficiency anemia, which can leave you feeling weak and fatigued. Uh, anemia is when you, um, you're, a couple of different ways you can get it, either from low iron levels in your blood or just low blood count. Um, and that can make it hard to transport oxygen to your tissues, which is, will leave you feeling tired and weak and cold. Uh, it can also leave you with strange cravings called um, pica. Pica is a disorder where you crave non-food substances uh, like dirt or, or um, you know, you see kids eating dirt or chewing on pencils or uh, those types of things. Um, this can be, um, pica can be a mental disorder too. Uh, you can have people that uh, are pica that just, they tend to, um, if they have some sort of mental dis disease or disorder, they might just, you know, eat batteries, eat pencils. I, I used to work in a mental health facility and, and there were people that you, you couldn't have any inanimate objects around them because they would, they would literally eat them. That's a mental disorder. That's a little bit different than the, the craving to eat non-food substances because of deficiency in iron. So if, if you find yourself craving, you know, if dirt smells good to you or clay soils smell like they would taste good, that's usually a sign you're deficient in iron. And that, that craving of non-food substances is known as pica. So not only iron, but again, also protein. Uh, vegans can especially struggle with this since they don't eat any animal products as well. So if you're cutting out animal flesh and animal products such as eggs and cheese and yogurt and cottage cheese and milk, um, you really cut out a lot of protein sources. So, um, you know, there are a lot of veggies like beans, uh, veggies, beans, they have protein. But you really have to plan a diet really well because, um, you know, there's only so many beans out there and, and veggies are not typically high in, in protein. But... But you can, you can have a very healthy diet. It's just a few things to pay attention to if it's something you've ever thought of embarking on, seeing if you want to try and be a vegetarian or a vegan. Um, it just a, takes a lot of planning. Um, so that, uh, that wraps up the chapter on, on protein. Again, remember proteins provide us four kilocalories per gram uh, of energy. For, uh, for, every gram, for every gram of protein, you get four kilocalories of energy tends to be the last choice of, of uh, our energy sources of the three, carbs, proteins, and lipids. Proteins tend to be the last one we choose. And again, uh, big reasons for that are because um, proteins are just not the fuel of choice of the brain. The brain likes glucose. Uh, it's a terrible storage molecule. Uh, our fats and lipids are a greater way to store um, long-term energy. And, and proteins have so many other functions in our body. Uh, from enzymes to muscles to hair and nails and skin to uh, pigment to uh, blood proteins. Their proteins are everywhere in our body and have so many different functions that their function as an energy source tends to be the last one. And also because of that urea waste that we make, our kidneys have to process it. It's a normal part of life, but uh, constantly having excess urea uh, can in the long term uh, be very hard on your kidneys and can lead to kidney disease.